czy na włosy szałam. Joseph's brothers took his tunic. They slaughtered a hairy goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they had the ornamented tunic sent out and had it brought to their father and said, we found this. Pray recognize whether it is your son's tunic or not. Jacob recognized it and said, my son's tunic, an ill-tempered beast has devoured him. Joseph is ripped, torn to pieces. Jacob tore his clothes. He mourned his son for many days and all his sons and daughters arose to comfort him but he refused to be comforted. That heart-wrenching passage from the book of Genesis is the Torah source for what is evidently one of our most ancient Jewish customs, ripping our clothing as a sign of mourning, what is known in Hebrew as Kriya. I always find this to be a helpful ritual as part of a funeral service. On a logistical level, for those of us in attendance who are outside of the inner circle, it helps identify the mourners and immediate family. All of those with a black ribbon or a torn shirt are the close relatives of the deceased who most need our presence and comfort. For the mourners, it's a visceral and physical manifestation of their grief. The sound of making the tear is an auditory expression at a time when the mourners may not have their own words to process their loss. The rip also represents a breaking point. Through this basic act of destruction, something that would otherwise be frowned upon in Jewish tradition, we symbolically acknowledge that the world has changed. We can look at that rip and think of a time before when we were whole and a time after when we no longer are. The ritual is accompanied by a brief invocation, Baruch Dayan HaEmet, blessed is the source of truth, a reminder that God too is with us in that difficult moment. You would think that this custom of tearing would be straightforward. Make a tear, you did it, good job. But the rabbis are going to do what the rabbis do. And there are dozens of detailed laws about the proper way to perform Kriya. How long the tear should be, where it should go, which garment, how we slightly modify the ritual for different family relationships. Most of that need not concern us, especially in a context where many of us choose to honor this tradition through tearing a symbol through tearing a symbolic black ribbon rather than an actual article of our clothing. There is, however, an interesting detail included in the literature of halacha, of Jewish law. The Shulchan Aruch, the authoritative law code compiled in the 16th century that is still the basis for most Jewish practice today, instructs us that after seven days, one may repair the torn garment partially using irregular stitches, and after 30 days, one may fully mend the garment. There are aspects of that guidance that harken back to an earlier time, a time when more people would have known how to mend, a time when things weren't so disposable. I have never known a mourner to repair the clothes that they used for Kriya. But there is symbolism here that extends beyond the material value of a shirt or a blouse or a suit. This is but one more way in which the Jewish tradition guides us along a shifting and evolving path of grief. If the tear we make in our clothing on the day of the funeral is a tear that we experience within ourselves, at the end of Shiva, we are hopefully on the mend. We stand up and return to the world perhaps past the most acute stage of grief, but still not intact. Our stitching is still crooked. After a month with more time to integrate the experience of loss, we may finally be ready to repair the tear. Yet even so, we are still not whole, at least not in the sense of returning 
exactly to the way we were before. As Rabbi Sharon Brous explains it, the torn garment, gingerly repaired, is like scar tissue over a wound. The skin around the mark is simultaneously more, more tender and tougher, having been torn apart and stitched back together. Simultaneously more tender and tougher. I fully understand and can relate to the tenderness. This has been a year of tenderness. A year where I have seen far, far too many tears and shed more of my own than I ever expected to. I received so many phone calls from friends, from congregants who felt completely overtaken by vulnerability. An attack on Israel that felt like an attack on all Jews. The pain of Israeli parents and children that we too easily could envision as our own family and our own pain the continual loss and heartbreak in the stories of the hostages and their families, the fear that comes from hatred that is pointed in our direction indiscriminately and inexplicably. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs wrote in his book, A Letter in the Scroll, that I knew that being Jewish was not something private and personal, but something collective and historical. It meant being part of an extended family many of whose members I did not know, but to whom I nonetheless felt connected by bonds of kinship and responsibility. Those deep connections result in unbearable tenderness. Yet the trials of Am Yisrael, the trials of the Jewish people post October 7th, were only compounded by the events that any year would have in store for us. There were still birthdays and anniversaries, weddings, brisses and baby namings, and of course, illness, personal hardship, and funerals. In the last year, we said goodbye to Anna Kersner, a nonagenarian stalwart of this community who for many years single-handedly kept us fed on Shabbat after services. We also unexpectedly lost Jason Montebianchi, a relative newcomer to this community and to the Jewish people, but someone who showed up for everything, would volunteer for anything, and would give this community the shirt off his back. Both of them would be dismayed that I am talking about them from the Bima on Yom Kippur. Yet for me, their deaths remind me that even in the wide and turbulent sea of the Jewish world in 5784, our own stories and people matter. I miss them both, and I can't believe that they're not here this year. And it is the power of community that allows us to balance the tenderness we feel with the toughness we need. A funeral concludes with burial, the bookend that closes the ceremony that started with the kriya, with the tearing. As Jews, we approach burial with the utmost care. It is an act of chesed shel emet, a true kindness that cannot be repaid. As such, it is too important and too meaningful to leave to a stranger or a professional. The family of the deceased is obligated to bury their loved one, to fill in the grave with earth, not only because of the importance of chesed shel emet, but also because, like the rip in our clothing, it makes things real. When you hear loose earth and pebbles rain down on the wood of a casket, you know, despite everything your heart wants, that that person won't be waiting for you with a hug when you get home. This is real and this is final. But as the Jewish community, we would never, never leave a family to face that alone. We line up behind them, every one of us who is physically able, and often many of us who aren't but can't bear the idea of stepping aside, and we take on this impossible task with them. It is inevitably the most awkward part of the funeral. I will tell you from experience, there is no way to hold quiet, solemn space as dozens of people line up to pass one or two shovels back and forth. Yet this is not a ritual that I would consider optional. 
By the time the task is done, when family and friends form two lines so that the mourners can walk away from the grave, feeling the love and support of their community, that tenderness is already being transformed into toughness. Community forms the crux of personal strength. I have found that I can no longer stomach the language of silver linings. I first realized that during the early days of COVID, when we attempted to make ourselves feel better about the hardships of lockdown and the Zoom world. Yes, it was great to be able to attend Shabbat morning services from the couch while wearing slippers. However, that would never lessen the pain of someone who had a relative in the ICU on a respirator or make a family that had to cancel a wedding or a bat mitzvah feel better. There is no such thing as a silver lining in the midst of a year of war, in the deaths of so many thousands of people. But that doesn't mean that nechemta, that comfort and consolation don't exist. What I have heard from so many people is that they are so grateful for the backbone of the Jewish community and of the presence of CAA, of this Jewish community, that helped them weather the challenges of the year. We held our friends, family, and neighbors through national and personal hardships. There are similar forces at work in the larger Jewish world as well. There are two contexts in which the word surge is being invoked in American Jewish life these days. The first concerns the unconscionable rise in anti-Semitism. Paradoxically, however, in response to that alarming trend, we are seeing a striking rise in Jewish engagement across the American Jewish community. The Jewish federations of North America began referring to that as the surge. Across age demographics and synagogues, large and small, Hillel's, Chabad's, Jewish camps, Jewish schools, and even conversion classes, we have seen a sustained spike in Jewish engagement. People are searching for Jewish jobs, looking to connect with Jewish friends, and searching to learn more about their Jewish roots. According to one study, 43% of American Jews express new interest in increasing their engagement with Jewish life, and 23% had already taken the first step by attending a class, joining a Shabbat synagogue service, or participating in an advocacy effort. This is the torn garment, gingerly repaired, the scar tissue over a wound. As individuals, we are more tender, having been torn apart. As a community, we are tougher, having been stitched back together. As Debbie's words highlighted last night, Congregation Av Asachim was actually surging before surging was cool. Thanks in no small small part to strong lay leadership, an exceptional education director, a core of committed regulars, and a willingness as the only Jewish community for miles around to work very hard to be a catch-all to anyone who needs a Jewish home, this community is thriving. Our 128 years of existence prepared and preserved us for difficult moments such as these. Dr. Michal Biton writes that whether by the vagaries of destiny or by divine providence, Jews have most often been a visible and distinct minority in their host societies. And I would argue that this historical reality strengthened the commitment among Jews. In the face of untold persecution and demands that they give up their particularistic attachments, Jews held on to their traditions and supported each other from a sense of deep commitment to their fellow Jews across time and space. We do not know what the year ahead might hold. Unfortunately, we now have a baseline for how unexpectedly and awfully a year can turn. As we begin the Yisker service, a service that is a touch point to examine our own personal loss, grief, and memory, a service that is an opportunity to reflect 
on a national year of loss and a service that in its most basic form is a moment of tenderness. Let's also be thankful for the community that surrounds us, a source of our strength and healing, a helper to mend what is torn. <laughs>